I would Great. like to uh, welcome all of you to this evening's uh, presentation, Local Gardening and Living Landscapes, Transitioning to Productive Futures. Uh, my name is Bradley Flam. I'm the director of Westchester University's Office of Sustainability, and I, I'm honored to have been designated the host this evening. But I am not going to talk very long because, um, like all of you, I'm very much looking forward to hearing from uh, our four panelists tonight and our moderator, Professor Joan Welch, who is going to um, uh, lead the conversation this evening. I will just um, start, however, by saying that this um, event is uh, another in a long series of collaborations between the Office of Sustainability at the university and the members of uh, the Chester County Environment Alliance and uh, the Westchester Green Team. We're um, grateful that we um, have been able to work uh, so often and on such important uh, presentations and events and film series and lectures uh, as we have been able to do so. Um, and I will just on a personal note um, say that uh, uh, this type of uh, presentation that um, for us is a combination of, of old friends and colleagues and lots of new people uh, is just really exciting and we're, we're looking forward to the conversation. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Welch and hand the, um, the digital floor to you. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Yeah, this is going to be a wonderful event. I'm looking forward to it. I wanted to just share a few uh, etiquette reminders about being on Zoom. And that is, you know, we'd love to hear from all of you, but when a panelist is speaking, please mute your microphone. And then if you're like me, don't forget that it's muted when you want to talk again and you're <laughs> thinking everybody can hear you. But uh, let's please remember to be um, respectful of the people who are presenting. And I have been teaching at Westchester for uh, many decades now and I came to Westchester with a number of environmental science degrees. And it's sort of what I've been doing since I, since I got here. And for me, the big transition was when I lived in Spain as an undergraduate. And I recognized they had a food system that was very different from ours. They ate fresh food, it was local. Their fields are very close to their communities. And there was a food culture that you could trust to give you good food. Humans have been using the planet, have been on the planet for not too very long, but we're very, very creative and successful animals. And we've really changed the surface of the earth extensively. And agriculture was sort of our first, if I could use the word assault on the planet. And certainly the way that we do agriculture today is a, a tragedy, right? We're experiencing the sixth greatest extinction. And that means that we've lost anywhere from 40 to 80% of all insects on the planet at this point. And here in North America, we've lost one out of four birds in the last 50 years. And that is in part due to the loss of habitat, but also the way that we do agriculture. Modern monoculture, petrochemical intensive industrial agriculture is taking us all down. <laughs> and so tonight, we're gonna hear about ways that you and I on a local scale can begin to change our agriculture, recapture, reclaim our agriculture and our habitat landscapes, because we also know that the climate crisis is here. And that is also due in a large part to the way that we carry out growing food and shipping it around the world and throwing half of it away, right? So I think if we have a much healthier local agriculture system and also a local habitat effort where we change our landscapes to be 
more diverse and more welcoming to the insects and birds and plants and other animals that desperately need our support. So without further ado, I'm pretty sure that tonight's event will inspire us to restore and heal. And I'm going to call on Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. How many of you know who she is? Has anyone, right? She wrote Braiding Sweet, Sweet Grass and Gathering Moss. And she says, as far as landscape restoration is concerned, what we really need to heal is our relationship with the land, right? That's what we really need to heal. And so I am, I'm excited to hear about these conversations tonight and the ways in which our panelists have been healing their relationship with the land and the landscapes around them. And so what we're gonna do is hear from each of the panelists, uh, maybe eight minutes or so. And I would ask that you hold your questions until all panelists have had a chance to uh, share their material. And then if you have questions and you don't want to forget them, if you're like me, <laughs> the, the question can disappear quickly. In the bottom of the screen, there's a chat function and you're welcome to uh, put any of your questions or comments or observations in the chat and, and I'll be keeping track of it. And so I thought uh, we would start with uh, Mr. Jim Hines, who is a wannabe farmer. And I would say he probably is a farmer, right? When he's been growing food for 20 plus years. And uh, he's a member of this community, Westchester community. And I'm very excited to hear about the methods that he uses. And it sounds like it's been a, wa a wonderful journey that he, he learns something new every year and uh, lots of experimenting going on. I think we all, all, all know that's the way growing food and trying to change our landscapes into good habitats the way it works. So, um, Jim. Hi, Joan, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here tonight. Oh, gardening, awesome. Just uh, earlier tonight, I was down at a neighbor's for helping them prune back a rose. I said, uh, what better thing to do tonight before a little webinar and do some real gardening and get out. And tonight was just a beautiful night here in the borough. I'm Jim Hines. I live on the north end of the borough. Uh, my yard is a third of an acre. We have a single home up on the north end. The wife's gracious. I've had four or five different garden layouts in the past 10 years that we've been here. And this Two years ago, I finally settled in on a final layout of about 300 square feet of actual garden space. I'm totally changing the way I've been gardening for years after a lot of YouTube watching and a guy over in England called Charles Dowding. He touts no dig, no tilling in a way that I haven't seen before. And not just that, but a way of he's broken down gardening in the vegetables in different seasons that you plant, start to something in early spring, and that will run till June, July. And then you're ready to pull it out and replant July for the rest of the year. Just concepts, ways of, I, I never thought of it that way before. Um, uh, um, you get your garden going and by late August, things are dying out and particularly your tomatoes and peppers, disease and things just don't look good. You're like, what should be going in? Well. A lot of the stores aren't going to have transplants for us in July, all, late mid-July, August. Well, now we got to do it ourselves if you really want to carry through to that fall. And that's, that's what I started two years ago. Um, and it really, really made a difference in our past two seasons. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I garden because I just, I just enjoy it, getting outside. Um, wasn't a big sports fan as a kid. So with the grandparents... Uh, doing stuff with the old man, just carrying on, taught us how some of the stuff I paid for in classes. I'm suddenly sitting in a class thinking, I learned this years ago about not just putting the seed right into the, starting it right where you do a direct sow, but making, doing a trans, uh, planting over somewhere else and then transplanting it over to a, the non-protected area and getting into your garden. 
just different little techniques you learn as you go that you didn't realize you already knew. Um, but I just like it. I get out. Uh, like I said, I helped the neighbor this afternoon. I also, just before we started, started putting in my greens. The conversation before we started here was who planted what so far? Well, yeah, I've got my peas in, two separate batches, one for actual peas, one for pea shoots to just take off the ends to put in the salads as a green. Also put in, what, a bunch of mescaline, lettuces, an Asian mix, um, just normal us garden stuff this early in the year. I do a lot of different kinds of things. Um, no real name for anything that I do. A mix of probably, there's permaculture mixed in there with some natural gardening. Um, I'm getting more into getting, uh, I hear a plane, let me tell you this. I'm getting more into getting to perennials, especially for flowers and shrubs. I'm done with the, the, daff the dahlias where you're planting, digging up. They're nice, they're beautiful, don't get me wrong, we all love them, but oh. At the end of the year, you're dealing with it. Joe and I see you smiling. Yeah, I told a neighbor last year, I said, I'm done. And <laughs> she just chuckled. Um, so that, that's kind of why I do it. What, why, uh, what kind of gardening I do. It's a blend. Um, I try to go totally natural. Oh, again, with my new technique, I've cut out fertilizers. I've stopped um, everything that is water soluble. I do two inches of compost in the fall or toward the fall, or maybe in the spring, depending on when the bed is empty. And that's all I use. Again, this uh, the English gentleman, Charles Dowding, that's all he does. He's a market gardener. He makes his own compost, two inches on a year, and his gardens, his beds look great. It makes enough that that's how he's selling. Um, I've started, huh, we could go off on a whole compost thing, COVID, wrecked a place I used to go over in Phoenixville and got my compost. Met many years looking and studying compost. I have a microscope. I bring stuff in. I want to see, are the living microbes in what I'm buying? Many places, no. Um, I'm sure many of us have followed Dr. Elaine Ingram. And one of her big sayings is, most compost that's sold is putrescent yard waste. It's just stuff that people have let sit and it's not compost. It's just rotting at nothing. And for the past two seasons, I ran into that. Um, one of our big wood chip sellers in the area claims they sell a leaf compost and it smells just like their wood chips. And I got hit with that this year. I ended up scraping my truck. I got two loads, mushroom soil on one top, on the bottom and the leaf compost on the top. I climbed on the truck with a five gallon bucket and scraped all the leaf compost off and just use the mushroom soil. It's in the back, I'll compost it down later. Check your compost. It shouldn't stink. It should look like soil. It should, it should look like compost, it look like earth. If it doesn't, something's wrong. And we gardeners, we're truly being sold. I don't know what, but I would not classify a lot of it as compost. Um, this year, I'm on a mission to compost, to learn to teach myself how to compost. I talked to a neighbor who he's helped me out. What neighbor's going to complain when you say, hey, you mind if I cut your yard every now and then? I need the grass. I just fertilized his yard with malorganite so I can pump the grass a little more this year. Um, I've got plenty of fall leaves and I'm going to learn how to compost this year so that I can have the compost I need to top my beds. Chall uh, that was um, one of my things on my list here was one of my challenges. That, that's a big challenge this year. Um, I'm huge with red worms. I have multiple bins in my basement. Um, I have a very tolerant wife that deals with occasional um, uh, the fruit flies. I don't have a lot of those, but occasionally, uh, again, we bring things in from outdoors, we get bugs. And she tolerates that, but I've got, I really ramped up last fall, the feeding of them. And I have, I think, three 28-gallon Rubbermaid bins in the basement ready to start spreading on the beds as I plant and to augment my soil this year. So that's my big thing is composting, doing more with my worms to really make the soil augmentation, the, not so much a fertilizer, but something that helps the soil, helps that uh, soil food web um, and just get that to build and grow where once you drop your plants in, the web is there and the plants tie in and it just, it just it, makes such a difference. Um, kind of rambling, got off on what I was gonna say, but that's about where I am. Um, I am all natural, don't use really any chems or anything. BT, of course, I think most of us use BT. 
I'm just happy to be here. Want to say thanks and uh, happy gardening. Thank you, Jim. Well, I'm sure there'll be questions later. I'm taking notes, so uh, okay. I'm looking forward to hearing some more about some of your ideas. Next, I'd like to ask um, Sally, Sally Jones, to tell us a little bit about how she gardens and why she gardens. And Sally has a path that's a little bit similar to mine and uh, sort of a Midwestern start and uh, somehow ended up back here out, out east. And while she's moved a number of times, it sounds like your family's been in Chester County for a while and Longwood Garden has been an inspiration for you. And so uh, you're sort of coming at this from more of a horticultural focus, Sally, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, uh, Joan, and hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. I'm going to talk about um, what I did to my front lawn to change it from a monoculture to um, a pollinator garden and uh, one that attracts birds and bugs. And so that's what I thought I would talk about tonight. And I hope that fits in the scope of our program. Um, yeah. So I was lucky, very fortunate to grow up on 50 acres of sort of abandoned farmland in Ohio and love to just roam and look at what grew, um, get my nose down in the bugs in the soil. And, um, but ever since then I've lived on an acre or half an acre where there's been very, a lot of maintenance with lawn and beds and plants. I never met a plant I didn't like, so I would get one from a friend or I would start one and plant it. And then there's all the mulch that goes around and the lawn. And um, several years ago when we retired, um, I said to my husband, let's go find a very small plot of land. And we found a house in Westchester and we have a tenth of an acre. And um, I said, no lawn. And uh, so this is a little bit of the story about what we've done in the front yard and I'm working on the side and backyard in a similar way. Um, let's see. So I've grown, I do grow vegetables. I have a plot at um, the West End Community Garden. My husband's family has two farms in Avondale and we grow asparagus, potatoes, tomatoes, uh, lime, Dr. Martin lima beans. We do a lot of our vegetable gardening there where there's a little more space and actually um, full sunshine, which works great. So I made a little sort of storyboard. Um, so I'd like to share my screen. I'm actually not in Westchester tonight. Um, I'm in Minneapolis <laughs> uh, visiting. My husband and I are visiting. So I'm using a computer I've never used before. And um, here we go. So please bear with me. I hope everybody can see the screen I've shared. Um, does that look right to everybody, what you're seeing? Okay. Yeah, let's look, it's good, thanks. Okay, great. So um, in the course of some of my classes and reading and noodling on the internet, I've been really interested uh, in learning about lawn alternatives. And um, so, based on a recommendation from one of my instructors at Longwood Gardens, um, he steered me toward two books. And I'm one of those people who can, who likes to read books and then do experiments. And that's pretty much what I've done here. <laughs> so I'll take you through my um, slides and do a, just a brief uh, explanation. So um, this is, the slide on the left, obviously, is the front yard. We live in a twin on Union, West Union Street. And um, there was a lawn um, and beds around the house with lots of mulch. The screen on the right um, is my front yard meadow, the same yard that you're seeing. If you were standing in the at the lower left-hand corner of the first slide and you were looking um, west down the street, this would be that end of my front yard. <clears throat> so it's, there's a different combination, different combinations of grasses and um, some native plants, some not native plants, but the idea was to cover the ground and change maintenance into management um, to 
because my husband uh, and I decided when we retired, we would visit our three children who live in Minnesota, Oregon, and Washington State, and we have four grandchildren, and we didn't want to have to have somebody come and maintain our property. So my goal was no weekly mowing, no watering, no mulching, no fertilizing, and no worrying about pets. Um, nix the maintenance. Yes to all the perennial plants that I love and many new ones yet to be discovered that have colors and textures and layers and completely cover the ground. I wanted this to be a dynamic community of plants that would change through the season, evolve from year to year, and yes, be um, you know habitat for birds and butterflies and bees and lots of insects. So how to go about changing from this maintenance of mowing and blowing and raking and that sort of thing to just managing it, um, managing the yard. This is a person that I follow, Benjamin Vogt. He's in Nebraska. He says, in a time of climate change and mass extinction, gardens matter more than ever. And that's my vision, I think, um, that I would hope that I, in my small way, and other people who are interested in gardening could really be willing to experiment, try new things, that we could link our um, ecosystems to each other and really change the way the city and the countryside look. We've got schoolyards, highways, um, our office complexes. I just love to see us, us uh, garden differently and there are many good examples of this and uh, I know there are a lot more in Europe um, as Joan was referring to earlier. And so there's really good examples on how to do this. This is what I did. So these are two resources that I use. These are the two books recommended by Dan Maffei, who is um, a garden designer in Kenneth Square, the No Maintenance Perennial Garden Book and Planting in a Post-Wide World. And I really recommend both of these books. They're great. Um, they helped me to, with kind of a transformation that I could really understand about gardens not being, or gardens being dynamic, that I'm not planting something to tend um, that I don't want to change, like my lawn or a tree that I'm pruning or shrub that I'm just working at so hard, keeping the weeds away from it and um, having it be, you know, a, a hedge or something like that, that I could um, learn about what grows well, um, native plants first, but filling in with other kinds. The idea being to really cover the ground. Um, that short plants mostly have shallow roots, tall plants have deep roots. The two can grow side by side. The deep roots grow through the shallow roots and you can have plants really close together. The idea being that this is what a meadow is like. Um, so I. So looking at my front yard and studying it for a couple of years while I was getting up the courage to do this, <laughs> I was noticing what I had in the way of requirements for light, studied the soil a little bit under the grass in my front yard, noticed how much um, rain I got, and the lay of the land a little bit. And then I started to compile a list of plants that would give me a variety of colors and textures and heights um, throughout the growing season. And then the plan was to plant them as close together as the, they would allow. And my management of this would be to, once the plants were established, was to just cut them down and chop up all the plant debris, all the little woody stems, all the short stems, any leaves that were left at the end of winter. So once a year, I cut it down in March and I just drop the cuttings on the ground at the base of the plants. So first of all, I had to get rid of the lawn and I didn't want to remove the sod that was there. I took this dogwood tree, dug it out and took it to my sister-in-law's farm in Avondale. And so that I just had a 20 by 30 foot square of grass. And um, this may cause some people to shudder, but I used agricultural vinegar, which is just much, much stronger than the vinegar in the, your kitchen cabinet, sprayed it on the lawn and there's no other plants around it that would be affected by that. So on a windless day, a couple days in a row, I sprayed vinegar on this to kill the grass. Any persistent 
uh, uh, plants that were still growing in my lawn that was supposed to have nothing but grass and weeds, I used some burnout on. Um, burnout is acetic acid and clove oil, I believe. So the grass is dead. I put in a little fence around it to border it, <clears throat> reducing the size just a little bit. And then um, I made a plant list of the kinds of things that I would. So I, as you can see, literally laying out the plants in their buckets, and then we're digging them in on our hands and knees. My husband, David, did a lot of that digging for me, very grateful. And we more or less, more or less figured <laughs> followed this drawing. Um, that was in about a period of about 10 days in August of uh, two, two years ago, two summers ago. Oops, wrong way. And by the uh, October of that same summer, what you see on the left is um, how the plants had come along. That's an aster in front. And there's some agastache in the back corner. Uh, it's just be covered with all kinds of bees and other pollinators. Um, I just leave the landscape alone during the winter. Let all those beautiful seed heads stay there. Um, I hope it's become home to different insects. And um, I just leave it there all winter, don't do anything. Then in March, I come in with my um, hedge clippers and my hand pruners and I cut everything down and uh, drop, as I said, drop all those cuttings down on the ground around the plants. So here we are in March of a year ago, just a year ago. Um, and you can see I came in in some of the bare spaces that will soon be covered with taller grasses. And I put in, I had planted the fall before some bulbs and those are starting to bloom in the first and second screen from left to right on the top. You can see the grasses starting to come along. Some alliums are blooming. And um, so now we're in maybe June, I think, um, of 2020. And there I am with my uh, pandemic, haven't been to the hairdresser to get my hair cut for about three months, I think. <laughs> um, next picture. Um, this is in July. The top slides are from July and you can see the variety of plants that are there. I hope you can see them. Filling up almost all the space with very little space um, around. Is that in everybody's picture? Okay, thanks David. Um, so, you know, right around the 4th of July, is there Coreopsis, um, some more alliums, some grasses, um, just a number of different plants. Um, then we went away for two months last summer, left the 16th of July and, no, one month, excuse me, 16th of July and came home, I don't know, the 20 something of August and didn't do anything to my front yard at all. Um, came home and it looked just as good as when I'd left with, you know, plants just moving along through their growing cycle. Um, I started to keep track of some of the insects um, that come and visit the garden. And that's been, that's been a lot of fun. Um, I think I brought a praying mantis home from the nursery. And ever since then, I've had a lot of praying mantises in the, in the yard. This is a, a buckeye, um, painted lady. Obviously see a lot of other um, insects and plants, but I haven't started taking photographs of them. So this is last fall in October, you're looking at an aster in the lower right corner. Oops, now my slides are not advancing. I wonder why my slides are frozen. Let's see, I'm not at my last slide. Is anybody there? <laughs> well, Sally, if you click on the screen, it might yeah. activate it again, and then you might be able to advance it. Thank you. Oh, great. I think we did it. So the, um, toward the end of the growing season, thank you for that tip, I appreciate it. End of the growing season, you can see the fall colors. This is um, 
oxydendron orbarium tree, some grasses, my asters. And then this is what it looked like coming through the winter. This is a picture from this year, the second picture on the 4th of March. And then because I knew we were gonna come on the road to visit our children again um, this spring, I went in um, about the 20th of March and started cutting things down. And that's when I found this praying mantis um, egg case that you see with the white circle around it in the top right hand slide. And I said, uh oh, I am a little bit early, um, but I still have to do the cutting down. And as you can see, all these pieces of uh, uh, plant material on the ground are just what I chopped off of the plants. Um, and I'm doing that because you know they're they're going to be ready to grow in a new season, and because I planted bulbs and their crocuses are already starting to come up. And um, so that is just very recently the front yard and. That brings me to the end of my slides. When we get home at the, in, a, in another month, I'm hoping to see a lot of um, a lot of other things growing in the yard, and we'll be well into um, growing season number two. So thank you very much, everybody. I'm sorry for the technical glitches. Um, I hope you could see the slides, and um, I'm looking forward to the other speakers sharing. Yay. Thank you, Sally. At this point, you need to stop sharing your screen. Okay. Let me figure out how to do that. Escape. Uh, close that. At the, at the top of your screen. There we go. Wonderful. So uh, the next speaker is a student here at Westchester University. She's been a garden intern for four years now, and she's probably knows more than anybody on campus about our gardens and about uh, organic gardening. And so uh, I'm gonna pass it off to Liz and then we, we'll, we're saving the best for last. No. <laughs> All right, Liz, take it off. Thank you so much. And thanks, Sally and Jim. Your presentations are really inspiring. I hope I can kind of live up to it. But um, so um, as I was introduced, my name is Elizabeth Schultz. Um, I am an undergraduate student still at Westchester. I'm sadly graduating um, and I guess it's a month from now. So that's exciting. But um, I do work at the campus gardens. So I kind of float between um, each of our gardens. Um, we have a, four different locations on campus. Uh, we have our North Campus, South Campus, Tanglewood, which is behind the President's House um, on Rosedale, and then also the Pigment Garden, which is out in front of E.O. Bowl. We don't necessarily, the garden staff doesn't um, do a ton with the Pigment Garden. That's kind of overseen by Kate Stewart of the Art and Design um, realm, and so I know they have separate um, staffing for that, but we kind of um, oversee the produce producing gardens, which are um, the Tanglewood location, North and South that I mentioned, but um, so I, I do primarily garden on the campus, but I kind of grew up in the middle of nowhere, um, still in Pennsylvania, but it's um, in Northeast Pennsylvania, probably no one has heard of Tawanda, but if you have, let me know in the chat because that would be um, amazing because that doesn't happen often, but it's in Bradford County. It's, there's more cows than people. Um, we had horses growing up, so we boarded horses for our neighbors. We had uh, goats, chickens, all sorts of things. Um, and my mom always kept a garden, so kind of grew up around it. Um, it was definitely my comfort zone, and I kind of was lucky enough to come to Westchester and fall into a political science department um, with Dr. Del Shad, who um, you know appreciated uh, food justice and uh, gardening. And so I ended up as a work study at the campus gardens. That's kind of how I found my way in there. I thought when I heard I was going to do a work study for the political science department that I would be behind a desk, you know, stapling papers or something, but I was really excited to find out that I'd be in the dirt. So uh, I've been there ever since. And um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit about my background. Um, and I, I know that um, Margaret and Nathaniel are on this call from the Westchester Green team. So I'm excited that um, I'll be able to continue gardening after graduation um, under the Westchester Green team at um, one of their new gardening locations. It's at Barkley Friends. Um, retirement home in um, Westchester Borough. And so we're starting a pilot garden there. So that'll be really exciting to be able to kind of continue uh, throughout the summer. But 
I really, um, in general, just kind of garden because it's something that I think is really satisfying. It's kind of therapeutic for me to be outside. It's a good change of pace from, you know, student life and things like that. Um, but personally, I think um, specifically in the garden, the gardening that I do in the community gardens, um, a lot of it centers around um, food justice and things like that. Um, it's really great to be able to, you know, grow things that can go to people in need um, and people who, you know, can really use this kind of produce. So. Um, and in general, I do plan to kind of have my own personal garden space um, as I, you know, move on from West, the Westchester um, campus garden. So definitely appreciate the low cost, you know, food supply and knowing where I, um, knowing what I grow and where it's been. So that's kind of a little bit about, um, you know, why I garden and that kind of thing. Um, but I do want to share some slides here. I just, I want to um, kind of touch on all the community or sorry, the campus gardens that, um, that we have at Westchester. Uh, I don't want to steal Dr. Delshad's thunder too much though, because I know she, you know, she's the real mastermind behind the South Campus Garden and our moderator, Dr. Welch is um, my boss at North Campus. So I hope I, you know, can do them justice, but let me just share here. Give me one second. For the amount of Zoom calls I'm on for school, I should know how to do this a little easier. <laughs> All right. Here. Can we see that? Perfect. Where is my share button? Oh, is it covered? I think it's covered over here. Whoops, present, there we go. <laughs> All right, so this is just my little my little spiel that every time I talk about the campus gardens, you probably, some of you might've seen these slides before, but um, hope I don't, um, not redundant here, but so um, let me click into, there we go. So um, as I mentioned before, we do have four different campus gardens. Um, Three of them are produce producing gardens. Um, Tanglewood is one of, is our smallest location as far as produce. Um, that's just a couple beds, um, raised beds that were put in behind um, President Fiorentino's house. Um, that started in 2017 and um, I believe by Dr. Dr. Welch, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so we're really lucky to be able to kind of um, extend our growing out there. Um, we also have our North Campus location and that um, is includes our demonstra demonstration garden um, and our bird habitats and um, a lot of native species are there. Our rain garden is there. Um, and we, um, a lot of academic courses, um, including like the science courses will go out there to do bird watching and, you know, observing insects and um, all the native species that we have out there. But we do also um, grow some produce there for, um, you know, and, people to pick as they go, but also um, to share any excess with the resource pantry on campus. Um, and so the South Campus Garden is our biggest producer of um, produce and all of the produce from the South Campus Garden, or I should say the majority of it um, does go to the resource pantry, which is accessible to any students um, experiencing food insecurity or really, really any students at all. Um, they can sign in. There's um, lots of resources there available, not only just our produce, but they also have, you know, clothing, um, you know, shelf stable food and things like that. So it's a really great resource for um, people on campus, but South Campus Garden um, and North Campus Garden and as well as Tanglewood, we do weigh and record everything that comes out of those gardens. So we know um, kind of roughly how much we're producing um, other than the one, the stuff that the groundhog eats and that, um, you know, people pick from us before we get to it. But um, we do try to keep track of everything um, and donate as much as we can. Um, and last but not least, the pigment garden, as I mentioned before, it's not necessarily one that we oversee, um, but it is part of our garden system on campus. Um, and that actually produces um, the art students um, kind of break down those plants into pigments and dyes and things like that, that they'll use for their art projects. Um, but that's our newest garden. Um, that one was just started in the summer of 2009, I believe, um, by um, Kate Stewart, Professor Kate Stewart um, in conjunction with um, our, our grounds managers. So that's um, been an exciting new addition. Um, so as far as operations go, um, let me see if I can get this. Uh, I think you might have a black bar on your screen that might be covering some of these. It's 
It's my Zoom window here. Um, actually, I don't know if I can move it without. Oh, it's, I think it looks okay on our end. It looks okay for you? Okay. Yeah, something, so. something it comes up with a black bar when I have my, uh, my Zoom um, screens in the corner, so I'm glad you can see everything. Um, but as far as operations, um, our gardens do run um, organically. Um, we're not certified or anything like that, um, but we do follow organic practices. Um, as um, one of our panelists mentioned before, we do use BT, so it is quite popular. Um, we have started using neem oil. Um, that's a derivative of the neem tree. Um, I believe it's native to India, um, but we do use that um, to kill you know, aphids, fungi, all that kind of stuff. Um, instead of using any um, pesticide, um, you know, chemical pesticides. Um, you can see in the bottom, the bottom left picture, um, on top of one of our garden beds, we do have um, a cold frame base. Um, we've used cold frames to extend our growing season on South Campus. Um, we use row cover, and I know some of you were in the call when um, we were speaking about our groundhog. Um, we use chicken wire, a row cover to kind of protect everything from pests, including insects and our uh, larger pests, of course, but um, got, a, got a lot of different things going on um, down at South Campus. Um, that picture with the cold frame bottom is from South Campus. The one um, to its right is from North Campus, actually this past season after we had freshly mulched. Um, so there's our North Campus one and then above um, with the compost, um, that's also from our South Campus location. Um, and that's one of our um, Part of our three bin compost system. We have a volunteer there who's so graciously <laughs> turning our compost for us. But um, as I mentioned, we do um, donate most of our food that we grow. Um, and South Campus is not the only location that does have compost. Um, the three bin system is also on North Campus. Um, and there's also a compost, um, a smaller compost bin that's located um, by the business building on campus. So it's like a small, um, you know, I guess I, I should know the name of it, but it's um, like a hand crank compost um, that people can, uh, it's open to the public. So anyone can dump compost in any of our systems. And we really encourage it because it, um, you know, this is what we use to fertilize our beds. We don't use any synthetic fertilizers or anything like that. It's really just our compost um, that we make here on campus. Um, we also um, do receive some compost from outside sources. So this year we um, are doing mushroom compost on North campus. Um, we also have um, some compost that we just, just got dropped off on South Campus. Um, we have a professor, um, Dr. Bosby Shell, he's a ge geology professor on campus who has a bunch of horses. And so he's always encouraging us to take his um, horse manure for our bed. So we have a lot of different sources that we get things from, but um, our compost on campus is really important to us. Um, and we do um, mostly run on, we have student, um, student workers like myself that run the gardens um, day to day and with the help of and guidance of Dr. Welch and Dr. Delshad who kind of manage everything. They also um, do get in the gardens quite a bit with us and um, physically work on the gardens. They're great. Um, but we also rely heavily on volunteers um, from students on campus. Um, we do take volunteers from the community as well generally, but because of COVID, we've had to kind of limit things. So we're offering um, volunteer hours to students every week in um, our North Campus and South Campus locations. Um, we also organize volunteer events and things like that um, during planting. We've, had, we've already had a couple um, this semester to try to put some new, um, new beds together in our gardens because we do, as you can see in uh, these pictures, we did have um, some wooden beds that had been there since the gardens were installed, I believe. Um, so we've switched out to some metal beds. Um, not every bed has transitioned yet, but um, we had some great um, volunteer events to um, kind of redesign our gardens a little bit. Um, we had a lot of space between our uh, beds on South Campus. So we're kind of trying to make things more efficient, fit a couple more beds in there. So it's been an exciting little transition period that we're at, but um, we're really thankful to have, you know, the student manpower behind us um, with our volunteers. But definitely with COVID, that's been one of our challenges is, um, you know, to get students back in the garden um, when there's hardly any of us left on campus. So um, we're excited to um, kind of get back to some normalcy, I would say. But um, as far as our campus and community partnerships, we do try to kind of integrate and collaborate on campus um, and in um, the greater Westchester area. As I mentioned, we do support the uh, WCU Resource Pantry. And for anyone who's not super familiar with our campus, um, that's located under Commonwealth Hall. It's um, in the Student Health Services entrance. Um, so if you, if you go in the Student Health Center um, and you turn 
to your left, um, there'll be an entrance there and that's how you get into the resource pantry. Um, they have, you know, like kind of like a mini kitchenette set up in there. Um, so you can just kind of grab and go, everything's free. Um, and you just kind of sign, sign in and out of there. Um, we also do send some of our produce to the Westchester food cupboard. We've um, contributed to the Veterans Center. We've kind of, kind of throw produce everywhere. <laughs> um, it ends up in different places, but um, anyone who wants it, you know, um, can have some. Um, we just ask that it's, um, you know, weighed and recorded before it comes out. So if anyone decided to ever volunteer with us, we can, um, you know, sign out some produce for you too. So we definitely um, want to get produce to anyone who wants it. Um, and as far as our compost systems, um, as I mentioned, we do um, rely on some students to and the people around us to contribute to them. Um, they are public, but in the past we have also partnered with um, the nutrition lab on campus. So in Sturzbecker, um, which is off of South Campus, we've um, had some students and um, I believe a couple of professors who were um, involved in the nutrition labs that they run um, for the nutrition students on campus to kind of prepare different foods uh, as part of their courses. And um, we had some students who would come I think it was once a week or it might have been more frequently don't quote me on that but um they would come and drop off any food scraps that they had in our compost which was really great to kind of reduce that waste on campus and repurpose it um for our, for our garden so that was super helpful um fortunately because of covid the nutrition labs are no longer functioning right now so um we've been missing that but um that has been a collaboration that we've done in the past um we also invite a lot of campus groups um, for those events that I was talking about earlier, the Abbeys and the Friar Society, our service organizations on campus that have um, given us a lot of help. Um, the Friars actually a few years ago um, helped us dig one of our permaculture beds. Um, well, our, our first dabble in the permaculture on um, our campus gardens, but um, we were doing a Hugelkultur bed, which um, is a ger it's German for hill culture. I'm sure a lot of you who are into permaculture probably know more than me about it, but um, we essentially had buried um, like a rotted log and a bunch of compost leaves, things like that, a bunch of um, organic material under the under this bed in the ground. And then we hilled up um, soil on top and then we're planting into that. So we've had decent luck with potatoes in that bed. And we actually just today, um, Dr. Welch was with me, um, kind of redid our, um, our bed on North Campus in the same fashion. So. Um, it's a lot of work to do that digging, but um, after after everything's in, as that log and like the organic material underneath the soil starts to break down, it kind of fertilizes um, that bed and it holds moisture better and it aerates the soil to have that that wood structure underneath. So it's um, it does really well as far as production. So we're excited to see how this one on North Campus turned out. So um, stay tuned for that. But um, as I mentioned before too, we also um, the academic courses on campus. We've had some um, some involvement there. Um, the nutrition labs obviously um, were partnering with us for the compost, but um, on North Campus, our outdoor classroom is a, it's, it's a backyard habitat um, certified by the Na National, what is it? National Wildlife Foundation. It's a backyard habitat, um, the Audubon uh, bird sanctuary, bird habitat. Um, group group I guess um, gave us a certification we also um, are registered rain garden there because we do have a water feature we have um, a source of food shelter um, young rearing um, for all of these um, species on north campus so we have a lot of um, biodiversity on camp on our north campus location so we do have um, like those science groups will come out and um, I know some bird watching classes and things like that um, We'll spend a lot of time in our North Campus garden when we're when we're not virtual. So um, that's been great. And of course, the art students um, are highly involved in the pigment garden as well. Let's skip ahead here. So as far as getting involved in the gardens, um, we do have a website on campus. Um, we have an, a campus email here, um, and we do, as I said, offer volunteer hours. Um, right now, we are just open to um, those of us who are on campus right now. Um, but generally we are open to, to the entire public, but because of COVID, obviously that's been limiting us. But um, here's some extra pictures as well. We have our tomato trellises with our basil on the, um, on the ends on the top there. We also have some, some volunteers on from South Campus um, in the left corner. And then the right corner is also from um, North Campus this past semester, um, at, right after our fresh molting, we were showing things off there too. So um, yeah, that's kind of where we, 
where we're at on campus, um, we definitely ran into a lot of challenges with COVID as far as, um, you know, staffing. We weren't, um, we weren't really allowed in the gardens or on campus um, for the summer that COVID really hit us hard. Um, so we kind of have, have been playing catch up a little bit um, recently, but it's been really great to get back in the gardens. Um, we've had a lot of work kind of reinventing ourselves with um, these new beds this semester. So we're still, uh, we just got some um, seedlings in from the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society. I don't wanna talk too much about that because I'm sure Dr. Dell shed will, um, but we've been really, um, really lucky to have a lot of um, great community support, um, campus support and um, yeah, it's been a really rewarding experience working at the gardens, but um, I'm going to be sad to be leaving soon, but I'm excited to start with the green team. So Margaret and Nathaniel, <laughs> we'll, we'll see you soon. But um, yeah, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'm excited to hear um, from Dr. Delshad. So thanks for having me. Yay. Thank you, Liz. That was fun. It was so green, right? It was amazing to see how lush the gardens do get in the, in the summer. So our, our last panelist, tonight is Dr. Ashley Delshad. And if there was anyone on campus who was more concerned and working hard to address food insecurity in our community and also improve the habitat in which we uh, produce our food, it's, it's Dr. Delshad. And I think she'll share a little bit more about who she is and the work she's been doing. So take it away, Ashley. Yeah, thank you, Joan. She's Joan is Joan is being modest in the many uh, ways that she has pioneered um, so much of the gardening work on campus, and I have uh, really benefited from working with her and being able to build off of the foundation she's established. And I'm trying not to think about the fact that Liz is living leaving soon because it makes me so sad. Um, she has been a joy, um, a joy to work with, and. Um, I am jealous of Nathaniel and Margaret for getting to have her a little bit longer this summer. Um, so gardening is um, maybe has been a part of my life since the youngest memories I have of stealing my grandfather's strawberries when I was helping him garden um, <laughs> um, up until the present. And, um, you know, I have a garden in my backyard as already has been discussed. Um, by by Liz, I'm very involved in the gardens on campus, particularly South Campus. And um, I've also taken students for a number of years and COVID has disrupted this as well. Um, on week long service trips to work in urban gardens in Philadelphia. Um, and those gardens really do generally have a, a core mission of growing to combat food insecurity and to build community through community gardens. And um, that work has benefited me and has infused my life um, in, in many ways, including creating the partnership we have with the City Harvest Program in Philadelphia that gives us seedlings um, for the gardens on campus. But it also really inspired me to want to learn more about community gardens and um, inspired some research I did um, a couple of years ago now. Um, on community gardens. I had an amazing road trip across the country studying the benefits community gardens bring, um, as well as trying to understand how local government, so maybe I should say my background is in political science and you're thinking it should be biology or something since, <laughs> since I'm a gardener, but it's not. Um, so a, a part of my objective was both to understand the benefits gardens bring, but to understand um, some of the political and um, policy issues that can either um, impede garden success, particularly community gardens in urban settings, um, or can help facilitate their success. And so um, given that Liz has talked about the campus and we've heard from some wonderful folks in Jim and Sally and talking about their home gardens, I'm gonna share a little bit from my research about community gardens and um, of course, I could talk about gardens forever and ever, um, and I'm going to try to keep it brief. I do have some slides, um, mostly because I also have pictures um, of some of the beautiful spaces I visited that I want to be able to share with you all. Oops, hold on.
steps. So I've had some issues recently as I've changed computers with showing full screen for the sake of time and not trying to hold up anyone. I may just share them like this so that we can proceed in a more timely fashion. Um, and these are a couple of photos from some gardens that I visited. I, I love this mural. This is from a garden in Chicago. Um, and I'm going to share with you all just to start um, a definition from the American Community Gardening Association that community gardens can be urban, suburban, or rural can, go, can grow flowers, vegetables, or community. And um, to give a little bit of background right now, according to the ACGA, the American Community Gardening Association, there are over 18,000 community gardens in the United States and Canada. And historically, support for these gardens has really gone up and down, um, often with economic cycles. And when the value of property um, is up and it can be developed into real estate that can be sold, uh, support for gardens goes down. Um, and when um, there's a lot of surplus of land in vacant lot support for gardens goes up um, to beautify those spaces um, and make use of land that is really not wanted. Um, uh, Liz um, and many of you may know that part of the project that Liz is going to be working with the green team on is establishing some more community gardens in our area um, and I am very hopeful that this will just be the beginning of expanding community garden uh, within the borough adding to that number we see. Um, so, um, as I said, in the research that I was doing, I was trying to look at the benefits that community gardens uh, bring to communities and looking very broadly at social, economic, health, and environmental impacts, as well as some of these kind of um, political questions, if you will. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to focus mostly on what I found about benefits and share some of the results from interview and survey data that I gathered. I'm happy to talk more about the, the political aspects in the Q&A if folks are interested in some of that as well. Um, but my research included um, visiting 55 gardens across um, 10 states, um, Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, Atlanta, Dallas, Denver, Salt Lake City, Portland, and Los Angeles. Um, thankfully, I planned this before COVID and carried it out before then. And I also had um, a, a survey of community gardeners across the United States that the American Community Gardening Association um, helped me conduct with um, their membership. Okay. Um, so I'll talk about um, social benefits first, and this is um, a photo I took from one of the community gardens in Chicago that you can see is a space that's offering lots of things beyond gardening um, in their community garden. Um, so they have the, the bee informed day is, is actually educating people about the honeybees and the hives they have within their garden. They have a kids day. It's a very multicultural community, so they have language exchange Tuesdays. They have outdoor yoga and meditation that takes place in the gardens. And this isn't unique to this space. Um, and many of the gardens that I visited, and, and I saw this initially in a lot of the work that I was doing in Philadelphia, they really are hubs for the community to connect with one another and um, to build what we might call social capital and really pride in the community. Um, and as you can see from this, even including the, the language exchange um, Tuesdays, this is often connecting neighbors from very diverse backgrounds across race, um, linguistic. I was at a garden. Um, I may have a picture of it. I, I tried to pare down some of the photos that I was in a garden in Los Angeles, I know, where there are at least four languages um, being spoken. And so the signage was itself um, fascinating to look at, uh, the signage in the garden that had so many translations um, and the way that folks you know, were able to find ways to communicate and share their culture through their food with people from very different backgrounds based on what they were growing. Um, religious, educational, and really a variety of age, um, age groups. Um, and another social benefit that came up a number of times across many cities was a reduction in crime. Um, as people are out in their communities um, and they're in these garden spaces, there's less likely, uh, less likelihood that individuals are going to be engaging in illicit behavior when they know that other people might see them do that. And so it really has created gardens as a safer, a safer space and communities as safer that are in the um, surrounding areas near gardens. Um, this is just a little bit of data from the survey and a, and a quote from some of the interviews that I did. 
um, where I asked individuals about their motivations for gardening um, and their attitudes since they've been gardening. And as you can see, the vast majority of individuals, almost 80% said they feel more connected to their neighbors um, since participating in their community garden. And many of them began gardening with that express intention, right? So almost 66% chose to participate um, to be more involved in their community. Uh, and as I mentioned, often this is really um, cultivating a lot of cross-cultural interactions as this individual um, that I interviewed stated. Our community garden is one of the most integrated institutions in our city with great racial and cultural diversity. The garden is located on public park land, so we are a county-sponsored project. The next set of benefits that I looked at um, were economic benefits. So, you know, obviously you can tell from the, the comments that Liz um, made and, and that Dr. Welch made, um, feeding people is really important to me um, and community gardens and gardening as a way to get greater access to nutrient dense food is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And certainly that's a theme that comes up in community gardens, um, both in terms of those who are working in garden spaces themselves and may be able to grow their own food and save, um, save money by doing so, but also by sharing that food with others. This is um, a picture from Salt Lake City. There's a large network of gardens there that are part of the, the Wasatch Community Gardens. And a lot of them have spaces outside of the garden where there are bins, or maybe they even have plants that grow outside of the fence line that are for anyone to help themselves to. Some of them also set aside certain portions of their interior part of the community garden where there are certain beds that are growing for donation explicitly. Um, another larger discussion that happens around community gardens in terms of economics, um, which fits into larger discussions about the benefits of green spaces, including but not limited to gardens, is that these kinds of spaces are also beautiful. And because they're beautiful and they make the community more beautiful, they increase property values and make a neighborhood more desirable uh, when individuals are looking to, to move somewhere new. Uh, in terms of individuals and the survey um, questions that I asked about economic benefits, um, the numbers here aren't as high, uh, so economic motivations may be actually not as high on people's agenda, but there certainly were economic benefits. Um, so a large number of individuals, 46% um, um, say they have decreased the amount they spend on groceries since they began. Um, began growing at their community garden and about 31% began gardening with that intention. Um, someone else spoke specifically to um, wanting to participate in the garden to be able to donate produce to the community, um, to the homeless, and to food banks, as I mentioned. Okay. Health benefits um, are actually the thing that came, as you'll see when I show you some of the data, um, came as one of the most important reasons individuals wanted to garden and the benefits they saw themselves gaining. And, you know, Liz mentioned that she likes to garden because it brings her kind of this sense of peace. And that was such a very common theme that I heard from individuals. Um, the mental health benefits were really, really uh, prominent. And research that's conducted suggests that these mental health benefits accrue both to um, gardeners who are directly participating in the gardens, as well as people who just walk by and get to look at the beautiful gardens or um, to come and sit and enjoy the beautiful garden. So the mental health benefits really trickle through the community in lots of ways. Um, there are other health benefits. Um, digging those who culture beds, um, <laughs> weeding everything that we do in gardens is physical activity, it's exercise. We don't necessarily always label it or think of it that way, but it's exercise, right? So being outside and being more active certainly has health benefits um, and increasing the consumption of, of produce also has some of those physical health benefits. Um, for, for my survey, um, there was lots of questions about health benefits. So I've just pared it down a little bit. 
Um, 61.2% um, said that they'd have increased produce consumption, 80.5% increased time outdoors, and a whopping almost 95% said that their mood has improved um, since they began working at their community garden. Um, many people went into gardening with, with um, these goals, 63.6% uh, wanted to increase their access to produce and almost 62% wanted to have those, those mental health benefits. Um, someone put it really con um, succinctly, I thought, in saying it's cheaper than therapy and got me into healthy eating. The last, um, the last item that I'm going to talk about in terms of benefits um, or environmental benefits, and there's a variety of different ways community gardens uh, might stand to benefit the environment. Uh, one, of course, is if we're engaging in this really super local eating, right, we're, we're gardening very close to where we live and that's where our produce is coming from, we're reducing what we would call our food miles. So we're decreasing how far our produce is traveling to make it to our plates, especially if it's just in the garden, you know, around the block from our house. Many gardens also have dedicated spaces like some of those that Liz mentioned um, being in the North Campus Garden that are specifically um, there to um, attract pollinators. Some of them have, um, have bees and hives actively within the garden spaces. And many gardens, um, similar to our campus gardens, are hubs for the larger community to drop off compost. So this is a picture from a garden in Los Angeles. Um, and this garden is you know, really marketed as a local compost hub for anyone to come and drop off their compost, um, which is a wonderful service um, to the environment and to the community. Um, in terms of uh, some of the responses that I got to individ from individuals about environmental benefits, um, about 93% said the environment has improved since they began, um, since their community garden began. And almost half of individuals sought out participation in a community garden with an eye towards improving the environment. Um, one of the interviewees I spoke with said a community garden um, is also an, is an opportunity, excuse me, to provide habitat to pollinators and beneficial insects. Our garden is edged in native plants to provide habitat. Our garden is a National Wildlife Federation certified wildlife habitat and a certified monarch way station. We hope that by doing this, we are offering an example to the community. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I am going to end there. And again, I'm happy to talk more about political, political topics, as well as nonprofit organizations that seems to be really important in supporting a lot of gardens in many of the cities that I visited. Wow, we've been around the around the country, certainly, <laughs> <laughs> in some ways around the world. So we have, uh, I know, I don't, I don't know if we have a time restriction. I'm certainly happy to hang out here and we've, I've got a, a bunch of questions I'd like to ask, but I'd like to offer it to any of you. Does anyone have any questions for our, our uh, panelists? If I could, I'd like to start with Jim and I'm really interested in your four season, three season gardening. And I'm just wondering how you manage that. If you're you're starting your own seedlings, you, you heard that we have a uh, cold frames, we use cold frames. We're trying to do three and four season gardening on South Campus using cold frames, but uh, any words of wisdom? <laughs> second. I started writing a list. Oh, I moved everything for the call so I can tidy up. <clears throat> Um, what I've gotten down is basically early spring to summer being end of June, 4th of July. And then around beginning of June, you'd want to start your seeds to go in the soil 4th of July to through the month of July that would carry on through either only till frost or things that could make it through frost with some protect in our area some kind of hooping protection you'd need to lessen the snow, lessen the, the wind, I think would be the biggest thing. I have not gone that far yet to carry things over the winter, but I'm taking things up to frost, a little protection into the frost. Um, I do start everything of myself from seed. Wow. Uh, wow. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, the wife, I don't let her see the credit card and the seed bills every year. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I see all the laughing. Everybody knows. Uh, I do want to try my own seed saving, particularly on lettuces. They should be simple. Um, I have a large wild, um, a mustard that just pops up around the house. It's unbelievable. I watched two in the front yard, got buried in this year's snow. And they're growing like nothing has happened. We've harvested a couple of leaves. They're starting to push. It's, it's amazing. So then, what is that? And then that takes us, what, early spring in the summer, summer in the fall. Like I said, I haven't gone trying to go over winter. And I just started looking at some things. Kale. Uh, I actually have one kale plant that did over winter. Um, I don't know how many of you around Westchester do you know about the Greystone area that just got built on 100 by the Wawa. Yeah, those deer have come into the borough. And in the fall, I lost stuff out of the blue wondering, where are things going? And then it hit me, deer have shown up. Talking to neighbors, they've seen bucks this fall running up and down West Virginia Avenue <laughs> in the borough. Yeah, things, I've been, only been here 10 years, I'm a newbie. And they've never seen this. And yeah, so, so we're preparing for that kind of thing. But yeah, I'm just trying, shifting to, to do the year round. You have to almost start your own seeds, especially in the middle of the summer, because no place is going to have them available. Yeah. Um, that, Can I ask a follow up to that? Do you um, have an indoor growing area with lights to do your seed starting? Yes, took the basement and I built a small grow room. I the measurements are probably eight feet long by about six feet wide. I've got two growing racks in there. One of the little oil heaters you see from Walmart. Um, have it set kind of low, but I know it stays 70. So we, we pay the price of the heat, the fluorescent lights. Um, I have two racks with five, with two grow racks with five shelves. And one of them has all five with lights and the other one has only one. So I have six racks, shelves that I can grow on. Mainly this year and this year I've really mellowed out and things are going very well that I've only used three. Uh, the, the smallest one for starting when they're, I use all six packs. Then I move them over to the next height so a little bigger. And really on the tallest one right now are just sweet potatoes, getting those slips going. Um, uh, pet tomatoes I'll start this weekend. I don't put I don't put the warm weather stuff out till June one. I know Mother's Day, but I wait. There's no rush. Stuff June one will catch up by Fourth of July to anything that went out and got a little chill by um, come Mother's Day between Mother's Day and Fourth of July, uh, June one. So that's that's how I've shifted. Um, I hear a lot of talk people using more compost. That's great. I'm really I'm I'm excited for people. If you're buying it again, my guy over in England has mentioned pot. Uh, I'm going to spell it P Y R A L I D S. It's sprayed on grass. It's making it through the composting cycle. And um, they, they're not picking up when they test. Your plants are seeing it when beans and peas, they start growing and suddenly leaves are curling. Things oh. just aren't performing like you expect it. And you wonder, what am I doing? It's not us. There's something in our compost. These chemicals are making it through. Beware of these municipal composts. They're doing, they're doing their best, but if they're collecting grass from everybody, you know, you see your neighbors with the toxic signs when they spray, that's showing up into what they're composting. And it's just, it's, it's now making it through the compost cycle, the heat, whatever's going on, and it's showing up. And just the big thing he's doing, and I'm gonna do it this weekend with my buddy, and we're gonna get some compost from his municipality in um, Phoenixville. What is it, right next to Phoenixville? I can't think of what his name is right now. Um, and we're going to take it, put it in containers, put beans and seed and peas in them and give them two weeks and see how they grow in a, with a control next to it and see how they go. If it comes up clean, I'll tell them, hey, go ahead, feel free, put it on your garden. But if it doesn't, beware. So that, that's my big scare right now is where am I getting compost? I already mentioned this, just the compost. And so I'm rambling, sorry. <laughs> we're talking gardening, so I get excited. <laughs> that's wonderful. I had a, a, a question for Sally too. I loved the selection of native plants that you had. Is there something that guides you? Do you want things blooming at all times or do you, is it a color combination or what are some of the guiding 
factors that influence the decisions about what plants you plant? Yes, um, thank you. It's all of the, some of all of those things. Joan, I um, of course have my favorite colors and, but I really wanted plants that would be beneficial for habitat, for nectar, food, um, for as many different bugs and insects and birds and that sort of thing. So that's one layer of decision making. I like the um, purple blue shades. I find them calming in the garden. I wanted grasses. I just wanted a real mix of different perennials. I wanted, um, I think I mentioned uh, seasons of color so that all the way through. And then the, the fact that the plants would have some winter interests. So um, I love to watch, sit on my front porch and watch the goldfinches come and eat the seeds from the cone flowers and some of the coreopsis. Um, so it's, and height, as I mentioned, the different kinds of root systems, I think is really important. It holds the moisture in the soil. Um, plants that are lean in terms of that, like lean soil. So they all, they all are going to, I, I put no amendments in the soil once they're planted. And once they were watered to be established, I don't plan to water them again, unless there's a drought. Um, and each season, I think, uh, I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna toy with it. I'm gonna play with it. The idea that it's a managed garden recognizes obviously that perennials aren't going to um, last forever. It's not like a lawn. We're gonna to have to replace some. Some will seed in, overtake others. That's gonna be interesting to watch. I'll decide somewhere down the road that maybe I will find available some a different kind of grass that I can put in plugs. Um, so it'll be ever changing. May I ask a question of Sally? I'm I'm curious um, how your your neighbors have reacted. Have any um, seemed unhappy with this decision of yours? Have any of them followed your lead? And the borough, have they said anything? Uh, no, the borough hasn't said anything to me. And um, you know, the Westchester borough is um, there are a lot of people who walk dogs and walk children and ride bicycles, and I get 100% favorable comments. A lot of people come over and you know lean on the garden wall and ask me questions and say what's blooming next or uh you know I, it's been very very positive i've appreciated that so much and i hope it beautifies the neighborhood there are other people who plant a lot of perennials in their front yard and you know have abandoned the grass brad and um so i'm just i hope other people you know the idea will catch on as I said earlier, I'd love to think of, you know, habitat corridors, just, you know, that birds and insects will have lots of places to go in the borough and beyond. So uh, I had a question for Liz and uh, I guess I wanted to hear from Liz, what was the biggest challenge that you you sort of ran into in your uh, gardening leadership experience because you've been through a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think COVID takes the cake as far as challenges for everybody. Um, but I think um, apart from COVID, um, I think just the um, the management over time has been a little bit of a challenge as far you know because we're we're mostly um, we rely on a lot of students. So, and obviously there's a lot of turnover with students. So um, we've, we're always getting new staff. We're always, um, you know, hosting new volunteers and things like that. So um, we've had to be pretty careful about, um, you know, making sure we're training and reteaching um, a lot and making sure that, um, you know, every new person that steps in the garden, um, you know, is fully educated on everything um, and is completely oriented because I think over time, it's easy to just forget that, you know, some of these students have never even seen a garden before. And so um, every time someone comes in the garden, um, I know last year I did a lot, a lot of garden tours. So it takes a lot of time um, to kind of reorient everyone and kind of introduce for the first time someone to gardening. But I think that's a really important stage to meet people at is, um, you know, this is their first experience with a garden and hopefully it's a positive one that we can give them. So I think that's been, it's been rewarding, but also a little bit challenging. Um, you know, 
so a lot of students don't like bugs so um you know we've had to come to, to come to grips with that so um it's been it's been fun but um and i know um on south campus there used to be um you know the beekeeping that happened down there and i know you know some students you know are scared of bees still so things like that um it's been really interesting um to kind of meet students where they're at um and even um getting new staff members and things like that it's always fun to see everyone's background especially um you know the younger generation i think gardening can sometimes um you know not find us until later in life but um i'm happy to see um you know the student involvement on campus so it's been rewarding but challenging i, I would say And then Ashley, what is happening to community gardens during COVID? Are they persisting? Are they making adjustments? How are they handling the COVID situation? And hopefully this will be something we can stop talking about soon, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I actually, you know, I wrote a manuscript where I'm, I'm really to touting community gardens as the COVID. Um, safe, wonderful activity for um, municipalities to encourage, right? I mean, it's outside, you can socially distance. And so um, I think, you know, a number of community gardens have had to adapt, you know, much like um, Liz mentioned, we limit the number of volunteers we have. And we have, instead of just saying, these are ours, show up, you know, we have a sign of genius so that only a safe number of individuals are there at a time. And we ask them to wear masks and we sanitize tools after everyone touches them. And so, you know, I, I've seen community gardens adapt those same kind of techniques. You know, they have somewhat more of a schedule of um, who's coming at what times, which day to minimize any kind of overcrowding at the gardens. People are asked to wear masks if other people are at the community garden at the same time they are and often to bring their own tools which is pretty standard at a lot of the gardens anyway um, in order to minimize touching the same surfaces as others but um, I think you know gardening both in the home uh, which we've seen I think that it's exploded right during COVID I mean you know Jim mentioned that um, you know he's buying so many seeds a lot of places are out of seeds right i mean there's been such a run on um, so many gardening supplies it has become it has become the COVID hobby um for lots of people which is wonderful uh, you know wonderful outcome of a really awful situation that we're in and so um, i think a lot of gardens have you know have adapted uh, in those kinds of ways and it's it's maybe one of the realms that hasn't been as affected um, as some other places because of the nature of the kind of outdoor activity. Yes, I've been uh, wonderfully inspired by all of our panelists tonight. And I am looking forward to having this sort of event in person and maybe <laughs> hosted, maybe at Sally's or maybe here on campus and, and we can all get dirty. <laughs> together <laughs> and eat some vegetables <laughs> and, and, try, <laughs> and try some vegetables uh, i had a, a volunteer in the garden the other day and i asked him what's your favorite vegetable and he said does corn count <laughs> I was like, okay <laughs> we got some work to do here <laughs> anyway any um last minute comments or questions or it was wonderful to spend the evening with you and I look forward to seeing you out and about. I'm definitely gonna walk past Sally's house and, and dawdle. I'll check on things for you, Sally. <laughs> and, uh, uh, do come to the campus gardens. Um, yeah, you know, in this time we'll have to be careful about how many people come, but uh, we're looking forward to seeing you on campus again soon. Any other comments or questions or concerns? Great. Well, thanks again to the Office of Sustainability and the Green Team and the Chester County Environmental Alliance for making this happen. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Good night. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Good night. Bye. Thanks, John.